Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, um, welcome to the MIT Faculty Forum. I'm Susan Phillips and I'll be moderating uh, this forum today. Um, by way of background, I'm, a, um, I'm an energy and environment reporter for the NPR member station, WHYY in Philadelphia. I'm also a member of NPR's energy and environment team. And my uh, connection to MIT is I was an MIT night science journalism fellow back in 2014. Um, as a reminder, uh, we welcome your questions during this chat. Um, alumni joining us via Zoom can use the Q&A feature found on your toolbar. For those viewing on YouTube, you may add your questions to the comments field next to the stream. Um, we also encourage you to tweet using hashtag MIT Better World. We will get to as many questions as we can, but I'm really delighted to introduce our featured presenter today, Natalie M. Mahowald, and she's a PhD, um, MIT 1996, Irving Porter Church Professor of Engineering at the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Cornell University as well. Professor Mahowald was under, has undergraduate degrees in German and physics from Washington University, as well as an MS in natural resource policy from the University of Michigan and a PhD in meteorology from MIT. Her research group at Cornell is focused on understanding global and regional scale atmospheric transport of biogeochemically important species such as desert dust. And she's interested in how humans are perturbing the natural environment, especially through biogeochemical feedback. In 2017, Professor Mahowald was selected by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as a lead author on the special report on global warming of one and a half degrees Celsius. Today, we will hear from uh, Professor Mahowald on this experience and um, hear important takeaways from the report. Um, so take it away, Natalie. Thanks a lot for here, being here. Thank you um, for coming. I'm sorry, I was trying to find the unmute button. Um, can you hear me okay and see the screen? I can hear you. Great, okay. Um, so uh, thank you for joining me. So I am a professor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, as well as a faculty director at the Atkinson Center at Cornell University. But I, I'm not gonna talk about my, um, my own research research. I'm going to talk about the um, recent UN climate report that was released back in October. Um, and this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, as uh, Susan already mentioned. And um, it, the, what goes into these reports is thousands of hours of scientists' um, uh, time as well as um, government scientists and, and other people's time. And so uh, in order to propagate this information, they actually ask us as lead authors to give uh, webinars like this about the report. Um, and so you can see here kind of this fancy uh, um, uh, logos and, and things um, with, with right, right here, this is the, the 1.5 report kind of logo. And so these come from the IPCC from the UN. And so much of what I'm gonna present today is really kind of the official line from this UN report. Um, although I'll show some other slides um, without this formatting that are more my contribution to trying to understand it. For this talk, I'm gonna have kind of two elements. One is you know, what it's like to be a, a scientist, a professor from the US on um, such a report and how these reports are, are created and then tell you what's new in, in this recent special report. Um, let's see here if I can go ahead, okay. Um, the other thing is, is besides just being a professor at, at Cornell and doing the standard research and teaching. I'm also uh, a director in the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future at Cornell. And um, this is a new center that I just wanna advertise a little bit. And, and our goal is to connect the faculty across the different colleges at, at Cornell 
for interdisciplinary research and um, connect the research done at Cornell to have an impact in the, in the outside world. So we're really about connecting within Cornell and then connecting to the outside world to have an impact on products, policies, and persuasions. And you, and you can think of this IPCC work as part of that. So um, here's an official logo kind of uh, slide from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is sponsored, as it says in the bottom there, by the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization. <clears throat> and this um, report uh, is kind of special in, in a few different ways, um, but, but here is the, the text asking us for this report. And um, what they requested was an IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels and related global greenhouse gas emission pathways. In the context of strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change, sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty. So th this is much broader than the usual calls to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which usually it's just, you know, assess the state of the science on climate change. You know, here we're we're supposed to think about climate change in the context of sustainable development and our efforts to eradicate poverty, or you know, we're, we're supposed to solve all the world's problems in one special report. So that's one kind of unique thing, and, that, and that's um, much broader than most of the time that the IPCC has worked. Um, in addition, it was actually called for by the UN countries as part of the Conference of Parties um, associated with the Paris um, Agreement at the same time as the Paris Agreement. And um, that's also very unusual. Usually the countries don't ask for specific scientific reports. And, um, and that makes this report very special um, in another sense. And that is that the countries really wanted us to look at limiting warming to only 1.5 degrees C. Um, in, the, in the previous reports um, that the IPCC has done, the lowest level of warming we've ever really looked at is a two degrees C. Um, and, and you know, it, it, business as usual is more like 4.5 degrees C, um, you know, with uh, some uncertainty bars. So they, they really wanted us to look at what could be done to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees C. Um, and so that was something coming from the, the governments. Now in, the, in this call already right away, there's uh, um, this contrast between climate change and sustainable development. And I find that this is something that in America, we don't always think about climate change, that we, we think about climate change as a problem of business versus the environment. But for the, the problem of climate change, it, it's a little broader. It, it's, it's actually development versus climate change. And so on, on this slide, um, which um, we, we tried to get into the report, but it was, it was pulled out the, um, just for space requirements, uh, although we have not been particularly successful at reducing our CO2 emissions, we the world, we actually have been very successful at reducing the number of people living in extreme poverty. So you can see you know, 1820 uh, to 2015, population is, is increasing dramatically. But you know, after about 1960 or so, uh, we started to decrease the absolute number of people living in, in extreme poverty here, this red part. And, um, and, and definitely the relative proportion. So, um, you know, we, uh, you know, Americans um, or, or the, the Europeans, we, we have a very high uh, standard of living. And basically we, we've gotten this way because of burning cheap sources of energy and cutting down any forest we wanted to to put agriculture in. And, and so all of these things have accidentally emitted CO2. And um, the CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere. And of course, the rest of the world wants to live like us. And so this is kind of the, the dilemma at the, at the forefront of trying to solve the climate problem is um, you don't want to stop people coming out of poverty. It, it's, you know, no one wants to live in poverty. And we can't not allow these people to come out of poverty. And um, the way that we came out of poverty was emitting a ton of CO2, many, many tons of CO2. And um, that, that's what they want to do. So we need to find a different way to develop. And we also, we, who have developed a, a rich, rich people, rich countries with all our resources, we need to convert to a more sustainable way of being developed as well. So that's really at the crux of, of this particular report. And here's the, the front of the report. Um, and you can see here this um, artistic, um, uh, artist view of the, the figures that are in the report that you'll see. And um, 
uh, again, it's, it's organized by the UN as well as the World Meteorological Organization. And, and this um, set of reports done by the IPCC is um, very uh, um, rigorous in the way that they're written. The scientists write the report and the governments accept the summary for policymakers of the report line by line. And so um, anything that they think is not supported by the underlying report or the underlying scientific literature, that it can't go through the summary for policymaker approval process by the governments. So um, this report had um, 91 authors from 40 countries. They were um, six American authors on this report. Uh, apparently there were over 1,100 um, people uh, nominated to be on the report from the different governments. So for example, I was nominated from Cornell to the US level and then the US nominated um, me uh, up to the IPCC international um, level and you know, 1,100 people were nominated. So it was less than 10% were accepted. Because of how broad the um, report is, then you know, 133 contributing authors were also asked to come in. There were 6,000 new studies done. As I mentioned, um, most of the literature really hadn't looked at trying to stay below 1.5 degrees C. Basically, it's, it's very hard to get any kind of economic model um, uh, to have emissions that keep the um, world uh, temperatures below 1.5 degrees. So new studies were called for when the governments decided that they really wanted us to look at these very low uh, temperatures. There were over a thousand reviewers and they had 42,000 comments, each of which we um, had to look at, consider, and um, respond to uh, as part of the official process. So it, it's a very well vetted um, process. So just to tell you, you know, again, how, how it works, you have a, a scoping meeting where an outline is drafted and that is approved by the um, governments um, as part of this panel. Then the um, authors are nominated and selected. Then you have a first order draft that's reviewed by experts. Then a second order draft, which is reviewed by both government scientists and experts. And, and when the governments review this, it, it, they have to review it for you know, whether or not it complies with the outline that was approved or the science. They, they can't say that politically we don't like that answer. Um, but, but it is sometimes very clear what the political intentions are of different government scientists, let's put it that way. Then there's a final draft report and then the summary for policymakers, the SPM is, is put out. And then there's this final um, government review and the approval process. So the approval process was supposed to happen between Monday and Friday on, our, on our October 1 to, to 5. And it's supposed to be done at 7 p.m. on Friday. Um, but often these um, IPCC sessions aren't done at the time they're supposed to be. Um, and so it, it was estimated it wouldn't, it wouldn't be approved by that time. Um, but so originally we kind of had, a, I, I would say a little bit nice hours, 10 to 1, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. for the first two days. But then Wednesday evening, they added a, an evening session, 8 to 10, 30. And then Thursday, there was a night session and then Friday, we went all the way straight through to 3 p.m. Friday before it was approved. And um, during these approval sessions, it's simultaneously, everything is simultaneously translated into the UN, the five UN languages. So, you know, if someone was speaking in Chinese or Arabic, I would put on the little header, head thing so that I could understand what they were saying in English. So that's one of the limitations is how many interpreters they could get in um, for all these sessions. So what happens then is that the co-chairs, the IPCC, which are um, Valerie and Jim, um, would present the different sections of the summary for policymakers, which are um, really just kind of headline statements and bullet statements. And then this is me presenting and some of the other authors over here um, presenting. And, and we would come up and describe and defend each of the points that we made and why we thought it reflected the scientific literature. Then the co-chairs would open the discussion and the governments would make interventions, it would be called. So they would um, say that they didn't believe it reflected the underlying literature or they would talk about um, the um, you know, ways that they thought the language could be cleared, uh, cleared up a little bit. So every government has to prove every sentence um, there. So I, I sometimes hear people say that you know, the IPCC doesn't allow debate, but that the government scientists have, have read every paper that's in the scientific literature and that we cite, and they, they make sure that um, nothing gets through that's not a consensus of the science. Um, so it is actually 
within the IPCC process very um, rigidly uh, debated, I would say, every, every sentence. So if it makes it through, um, it, it's quite, quite a, a good um, consensus document. Um, it's not innovative new research. It is you know, kind of boring consensus science. So here are the authors of the Summary for Policymakers and the, the co-chairs. Um, uh, this is me. Um, after, you know, basically two nights of not sleeping after the approval of, the, of this report. Um, and so you start out and, you know, it's 91 people from all different areas. And maybe I knew two of them from my previous work with the IPCC or, or work in this field. And by the end, you're, you're, you know, your best buddies with all these people because you've been through quite a bit, all these different author groups and um, uh, author meetings and then through this whole process of the Summary for Policymakers. So it's a really um, interesting bonding experience for the scientists as well as the government representatives, which I didn't take a picture of what the room looked like with the government representatives, but um, you know, it's hundreds of people there that you've really worked with very intensely over the last week to make sure the language is, is exactly reflective of the scientific literature. But we got the, the document approved. So again, here's the, the text of the report that, um, that we were asked to um, deliver by the UN. And, um, and uh, next time I'm, I'm gonna go through the results of, of this um, report here and, and really thinking about that balance between, you know, how do we uh, strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change and keep the temperatures as low as possible, but allow for development and preferably sustainable development and how those things interact. There are, there are other reports underway um, and the regular structure of the assessment reports. But again, here are the, the slides of the IPCC after all this hard work, um, thousands of hours of work that we put in on what they want us to, um, to, to tell people what the results were, what was approved by the governments. So right now um, we're at 1.0 degrees Celsius of warming from human activities. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, if we want to keep below 1.5, we have 0.5 less that we've already um, used up 1.0 of that. And this already has consequences for people, nature and livelihoods. If we take a look at the rate of um, the increase in temperatures, we would reach 1.5 at about 2040. But past emissions alone do not commit us to going over 1.5 degrees. Um, that we, we could actually um, potentially stop the growth of temperatures. Now, if we take a look at this graphically here, here from 1960 to present, you can see this increase in temperature. Um, um, the, and the, you know, this 1.0 is attributed to human activities. And then we just, if we just extrapolate linearly what's been going on at about 2040, we'll, we'll cross over um, 1.5 degrees. Um, and so that's pretty soon. And if we really wanted to, to stop at 1.5 degrees, we, we need to change what, what's going on. Um, and um, to do that, um, we really have to stop um, CO2 emissions and they would have to reach a net zero um, in about 2055. And um, we also, uh, if we did, if we, could reduce our emissions faster, we could actually have a higher probability of limiting the warming to 1.5 degrees. So if we take a look at um, the emissions here um, is the CO2 emissions, um, and you can see how fast they're going up right now. Um, we have to turn that around and stop emitting CO2, increasing our emissions of CO2 and actually decrease our emissions of CO2. And, and the faster we do so, the less CO2 gets in the atmosphere. And it's really the cumulative amount of CO2 emitted because CO2 has such a long lifetime in the atmosphere, the cumulative CO2 emissions that matter for the, for the warming, as well as there's some other constituents that matter uh, to some extent too, but it's really the CO2 emissions that are, are driving this. So we have to you know, turn this whole curve around instead of increasing, decreasing. Um, so what are the projected climate change potential impacts and associated risks associated with holding the warming to 1.5? And we were actually specifically asked to look at 1.5 versus two degrees because the two degrees has been previously assessed in the, in the reports. 
And one of the interesting things that happened when we focused on the 1.5 is, is um, that we started to look at, we in the scientific community started to look at what, how much does a half a degree matter? I mean, 1.5 versus two, is it, it sounds small, especially given the interannual variability. Can we actually tell the difference and does it matter to impacts for people or ecosystems? And so there were quite a few studies focusing on that point for this report that were new. And it turns out, yes, indeed, you, you can tell the difference statistically significantly between 1.5 and two degrees. And, and that means that you can tell the difference um, uh, potentially as humans. And so there'll be less extreme weather if we can keep the warming to 1.5 versus two degrees um, and um, less extreme heat and rainfall. And it would also lower the global mean sea level rise about 10 centimeters lower but the sea level rise continues for, for centuries as the system comes into equilibrium. And, and that would expose 10 million fewer people to the risk of rising sea level. In, in addition, at 1.5 compared to two degrees, there's a lower impact on biodiversity and species and smaller reductions in yield of maize, rice, and wheat. Now, now of course, you know, in some places you'll, you'll have an increase in crop yields and some places you'll have a decrease in crop yields. And, CO2 actually fertilizes some crops, but, but this is in the net at the global average, the, it's, it's better to keep to, to lower temperatures um, for the crop yields. In addition, the water shortage is associated with changes in the precipitation patterns and, um, and the intensity of the precipitation. The water shortages would be 50% less at 1.5 versus two degrees C. Um, there's also lower risk to fisheries and the livelihoods that depend on them and um, seven, uh, several hundred million um, fewer people exposed to climate related risks and the susceptibility to poverty by 2050. So for, for poor people who are vulnerable to climate change already, 1.5 makes a big difference compared to, to two. So when we think about the impacts of climate change, sometimes people um, look at it with this kind of thermometer look, which is the reasons for concern uh, slide. And here on the left is you know, the temperatures relative to pre-industrial levels. And then you know, unique and threatened systems, you can think coral reefs, so the Arctic extreme weather events, hurricanes, the distribution of impacts um, or the global aggregate impacts or the potential for a large singular event. You can see the you know, white is, we, we can't tell very much the difference, but yellow is kind of bad. And then you get up to the purples, it's terrible. So of course the, the coral reefs are one of the more susceptible ecosystems or the Arctic. And so already um, we've already seen over the past few years, um, a difference between um, uh, uh, already some events when we had hot temperatures uh, in terms of the coral reef bleaching. And so there's a little more resolution here than we had in the previous reports in, in terms of the impact of 1.5 versus two degrees, um, just because we've seen more events lately. So that's, that's a new thing in this report. But, but generally speaking, this, this is really quite similar to what was um, known previously. So if I show you the report uh, from the last assessment, the last full assessment, you can see here, you know, this is the full temperature rise. Um, and then in the future, this would be a, a you know, this two degree, um, temperature scenario that was considered before. And, and when we say two degrees, we mean a 66% chance of being below two degrees. So it's different than the mean, it's a probability of being below a, a temperature here. This is what we considered in the previous reports. And then this would be a business as usual. So we're comparing say a 4.5 degree C versus a two degree C scenario here. And you can see that of course, as temperatures go up, the impacts from climate change are, are higher. So um, th this was what was considered in the last report. Be because for this report, we were supposed to focus on 1.5 versus two, then we, then we really, you know, we, that's why this um, stops at two degrees. It's, it's not that the impacts stop at two degrees. Um, so the, the important point is every half a degree warmer we go, there, there will be greater impacts on um, different ecosystems and, and different human um, impacts. And, and of course the coral reefs in the Arctic region are one of the more sensitive. Um, and then uh, some of the um, areas with the poor and vulnerable are, are also um, very sensitive, especially at high temperatures. Um, so how would we keep to 1.5? Um, if we wanted to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C, the CO2 emissions have to fall by 45% by 2030. So in, in 12 years, we have to be cutting emissions by 45%. 
And, and this is much harder than if we just went for a two degree target. Um, although we still, again, we have to switch it from a growth to a reduction. To limit warming to 1.5 degrees, CO2 emissions would need to reach a net zero um, by about 2050 compared to around um, uh, 2075 for a two degree. So we, we have to go down much faster. Um, and reducing the, some of the non-CO2 emissions would also have direct and immediate health benefits because many of them, the methane, um, uh, which contributes also to ozone pollution and um, as well as the aerosols actually have air quality um, impacts as well. So there would be other benefits from cutting um, some of these CO2 and uh, associated um, air constituent emissions. Limiting warming to 1.5 would require changes at an unprecedented scale. Um, totally changing the, the, um, the economic sector, basically. So deep emissions in all sectors. Um, we would have to use a range of technologies. The, the report um, really talks about a whole portfolio of what could be done, and, and many of these would have to be implemented. Um, it also requires um, behavioral change as well. We need to stop flying so much, stop driving so much, stop buying so much, um, try to eat lower on the food chain, for example. These kind of behavior changes would be required. And we need to increase our investment in, in low carbon options. So there has been quite a bit of um, progress in renewables and, and solar and wind are actually cheaper than burning gas, um, for example, to generate energy in, in the US. Um, so that's a, a great progress and it needs to be mirrored in, in other sectors. We don't have substitutes in other sectors. Um, and we would need to start taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, not, not just emitting it and stopping emitting it, but we're gonna have to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and this um, all has implications for food security and ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, the national pledges alone from the Paris Agreement, um, the voluntary contributions that, that the, the countries agreed to at the same time as the Paris Agreement, um, while, while they said that they wanted to keep temperatures below two degrees, they promised to reduce their um, emissions um, in a way that's more consistent with maybe a three degree rise in temperature or 3.5 degree rise in temperature. So it's not nearly enough to get to where we need. And recognize that the US has pulled out of the, these um, commitments in any case. Avoiding warming of more than 1.5 degrees C would require CO2 emissions to decline substantially really soon, um, not not later, we, we can't delay um, basically. So we take a look at this graphically um, here, we started in 2010. So just remember that you know, our CO2 emissions have been going up um, greatly. And here's some integrated assessment model uh, approaches to, to get the, the CO2 emissions down fast enough. So here, um, these blue ones are pathways that have limited or no overshoot um, of temperature. So it doesn't go above the temperature target. In these scenarios, um, there, there has to be a huge um, change in behavior actually to, to reach these um, low, tar low targets without an overshoot. If we wait a little bit longer and emit a little bit more for longer and then cut, we, we're gonna have to have more negative emissions. You can see here, emissions go through zero. So we not only stop emitting, we actually start pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. And then there are commiserate reductions in some of the other um, non-CO2 emissions. So uh, again, here, here are some different scenarios. Here we're talking about CO2 emissions and the, the gray is the fossil fuel and in industry. This brown is the um, agriculture, forest, or other land use contribution. And then this yellow is, is um, really negative emissions, which are in, this, in the models right now, they use bioenergy and carbon capture sequestration, so BECS bioenergy carbon capture sequestration. So for example, corn ethanol, um, but then you, you burn it and then you um, stick it into the ground so that you're allowing the plants to take up the CO2, you burn it to get energy, take the CO2 that's emitted and um, put that into the ground. Um, and you can see with this first scenario that has no overshoot, there's very little um, BEX, but this is a very, um, a, a radical change in behavior um, to, to get this. Um, scenario. So we all have to stop flying and stop driving to, to reach this scenario. It's, um, um, it, it's um, probably physically possible, but politically or um, uh, um, behaviorally um, very unlikely. 
On the other hand, on the other side, you know, you take a little bit longer, you do some conversion um, of the industries and take a little longer, but you need a lot of this negative emissions. Um, and so, you know, we have all this infrastructure now to emit, uh, to, to burn fossil fuels and emit a lot of CO2, you know, up to the, you know, 20, 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. You, you'd almost have to have the same infrastructure but sucking down CO2 by the end of the century in, in order to, um, it, um, to get the temperatures back down if, if we delay you know, by 10 or 20 years in terms of getting rid of the CO2 emissions. Um, and it's just, you know, the CO2 emissions just sit in the atmosphere, what we can. So um, what is the interaction then between the um, reduction, uh, the emissions reductions and um, uh, keeping below 1.5? Um, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and, and trying to you know, have no, no poverty, no hunger by 2030. And, um, and many of these um, have a lot of synergies with trying to adapt to climate change and reduce emissions. Um, so if you have cheap renewables, um, the you know, solar and wind are cheap and we can deploy them out in a lot of developing countries then um, they won't have the air pollution problems. They won't have the water problems um, and they'll have a lot of cheap energy. So that would be great synergies. If the um, new energies though are too expensive or hard to implement, then that could adversely affect some of, some of the sustainable development goals and make it more difficult for people to come out of poverty or produce energy. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I should say, you know, the amount of land actually also needed for these negative emissions here would really um, put pressure on both biodiversity and food security in a lot of regions. So you'd have to take a lot of land out of production of food and put it into bioenergy in order to meet these targets. It's just a huge amount of infrastructure and it might have a lot of environmental impacts, water quality, water, use, water um, quantity, as well as the food security and biodiversity impacts. So you, you may Actually, you know, at this scale, you may um, uh, choose as an environmentalist not to go down to 1.5 because the adverse impacts from the bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration were so bad. Um, and the impacts, especially, say, on some of the poor people might be bad. Um, uh, let's see, I think these are a little more difficult. Um, just to summarize, we already see one degree of warming, um, but it's not impossible to be under 1.5. Um, we already need to adapt to the current level of, of warming. And at 1.5 or higher, which we're very likely to see, we're, we're gonna need to adapt to these higher levels of climate change. And we're already seeing harms. It, it's really ambitious to reach either 1.5 or a two degrees C. Um, to do so, we'd have to move to sustainable energy now, need to change behavior now, less energy, less ag, move to sustainable ag. And we need to develop carbon dioxide removal technologies um, that are better than the current technologies. The, the bioenergy carbon capture and sequestration, like I said, would take up a ton of land. The report identifies many potential trade-offs between climate policy and sustainable development. And you know, we especially need to make sure that we're not forcing expensive technologies onto developing countries because you don't want to block developing countries in, in their efforts to eradicate poverty or um, stop hunger. The report identifies many potential synergies between climate action and other goals. Now, um, when, I, when I give this, this report, Ed, you know, it's, it's, it's very ambitious to reach 1.5 or 2 degrees C. Um, and, but I, I just want to say that um, uh, we, we used to be on target for 4.5 degrees C at, at 2100. And so the, the whole idea that we can even be considering a 1.5 or 2 degrees is great. And you know, the Paris Agreement, even if we can't hit uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees C right now. We, we don't know if we can. Um, just uh, already with the new technologies and the renewables that are available, we're talking about 3 degrees, 3.5 degrees, which is much, much better than 4.5 degrees C. So uh, there's been a lot of progress on the climate change issue. And I'm um, hopeful that we will continue to develop technologies and um, techniques that will allow us to reach some of the lower carbon targets. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. That's, um, that was great. You gave us a lot to think about and um, there's a lot of questions here. So I wanna just jump right into that. Um, so 
Ray uh, is asking, uh, is the IPCC working on any technologies for removing CO2 from the atmosphere, such as converting dead biomass into biochar? Um, what, what, what is the IPCC's position on this and, and do they act on this directly? Right, the IPCC is really, you know, just does assessment reports, but the scientific community um, in the US and elsewhere is very much exploring other carbon capture techniques, such as biochar. Um, biochar um, has, is one of the many that has so many positives associated with it, because the more carbon you put into soils, the less carbon's in the atmosphere, number one, right? So that's good for climate change. But it also improves the fertility of soils. So it's just one of those win-wins that we should be doing as much as possible. And it's not actually that expensive. Um, it, it's not clear how much carbon it can get out of the atmosphere. That's the only downside, but it's definitely something we should be researching and starting to implement. It, it's one of the many carbon dioxide removal technologies that we should be working on. There was just a, recently a National Academy of report released that also talks about this issue. Um, and I think the US needs to be doing much more work on this. Okay, great. Um, and. Alejandro wants to know, could you please elaborate on sustainable agriculture? Are these existing techniques that need to be expanded? Right, so one of them is uh, this, um, for example, more uh, soil carbon sequestration in the soils, which is associated with no-till agriculture. Um, and uh, uh, there's also, a lot of people are talking about food waste, that 30% of the food that we produce is actually wasted. Um, how can we reduce that? Um, then uh, thinking about more efficient ways to produce uh, agriculture, for example, well, there's a lot of nitrogen um, and nitrous oxide produced when you fertilize, you know, that doesn't help the farmer if it's released into the air, it doesn't help the crop. So uh, these are the kind of sustainable agriculture practices that need to be implemented um, in order to increase our, you know, the fertility of our soils, you know, so it helps. And then it also helps the climate problem. Okay. Um, and this was in the news recently. Pete wants to know, um, do projections of sea level rise accurately reflect the rate of loss of um, the loss of ice mass in Greenland and Antarctica? Of course, we just had some recent reports out on that. Right. So, um, uh, Let's just say, you know, they've already started the next set of assessment reports. And so they'll, um, yeah, those recent papers were, were really alarming about an increased rate of, of sea level rise. Let's see if they hold up. I mean, we don't just want one paper on each issue. You know, usually you want 10 papers on an issue from all different groups saying the same thing before you move what the consensus is. So, um, uh, you know, I, I hope those papers aren't right. Let's just put it that way, because they're, they're arguing for an increased rate of, of um, lost of the um, some of the land ice that would increase the sea level at a higher rate than people had previously estimated. Right. Um, and Edward wants to know any comments on the recently reported falling ozone concentrations in the lower stratosphere on global warming. Um. So uh, yeah, I don't. I didn't see that study. That um, the ozone uh, is, is a greenhouse gas and um, you know for the most part it, 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 because of air pollution um, humans increase the tropospheric ozone which is bad because it uh, you know oxidizes our lungs for example um, but uh, stratospheric ozone is good right so we have good ozone and bad ozone and the stratospheric, stratospheric ozone was reacting to the um, chlorinated uh, fluorocarbons um, the CFCs and so under the Montreal protocol those were banned so um, it had been that the ozone in the stratosphere was recovering. Um, I, I hadn't seen reports that it was going back down, but um, the estimates were that if you had, uh, you know, warming in the troposphere, you'll have cooling in the stratosphere, and that would reduce some of the ozone in the stratosphere um, from climate change. So I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly uh, what those reactions are. Ozone is a, a small contributor to global warming, so it's not going to be a big driver, um, but, but it is important and has important health implications. Okay. And this is something you don't really hear much about, um, uh, population uh, size. And Ivan wants to know, since the increase in the human population is extremely important in climate change, 
what solution does the report state about population growth since it ought to stabilize or even decline, he says. Right. So um, we're a U UN agency, so um, we, we were not asked to comment on population growth um, directly or what, what should be done. Um, the uh, different scenarios that we use for the um, climate include population scenarios, but none of them include anything draconian um, in them. They're, they're just natural demographic shifts. I mean, here in the developed world, we've already had our, you know, we, we've been allowed to grow and now we're stabilizing. And, um, you, you know, from a UN perspective, you would normally <laughs> just um, al allow people to make their own decisions. I mean, we're not, we're not, we're not, the policymakers are not going to allow us to make any value judgments on how much population any particular country would have. So the IPCC is not allowed to, to comment on that. And, and I, I personally think it's a little unfair to say that, you know, now that, you know, we, we've already had our, our little demographic shift that they're not allowed to have it. So normally we don't go after population, but if you look at the sustainable development goals, the sustainable development goals include the education of women and the um, gender equality. And normally uh, when women uh, are more educated and allowed power, they tend to have fewer children. Plus if you have good health care and the kids stop dying, people tend to have fewer children. So that's all part of the sustainable development goals is to make sure that um, uh, people have the resources um, to, you know, live in the in a more, um, I, I guess, a, a fair world where you, you might have fewer children as well. Okay, and I know the report talked a lot about um, afforestation, and and Rod has a question: um, How much impact can aggressive afforestation have? So. Um, Reforestation, afforestation, and stopping of deforestation are um, all relatively cheap and, and good ways to stop emissions of CO2 or take up CO2. Um, and they have many um, co-benefits with biodiversity and all sorts of other things. So they are proposed as a solution. They, they don't do too much, okay? You, you can see them in some of the slides. The, it's just a little bit of carbon per year can be taken up. Um, but they totally make sense and they're cheap and let's do them. Um, so that's kind of the approach um, there. Okay. Um, and uh, Barkley wants to know, is it helpful? Um, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> I misread that. Can you discuss the uncertainties around the role of sinks, including um, oceans and forestry and the implications for required long-term emissions levels consistent with two degrees or 1.5 degree scenarios? Um, so uh, how much CO2 is gonna stay, stay in the atmosphere is, is not um, quite clear. Right now, the land and the ocean are acting as a, a very large negative feedback on the climate system by taking up a lot of uh, CO2. Um, but we think that they're kind of getting saturated and especially a warmer climate makes it harder for the land and the ocean to take up carbon. So the, the size of these sinks and, and how much they're going to continue in the future is uncertain. Um, and, and that does matter. Now for these lower carbon targets, it matters a lot less than for the higher carbon targets because the feedbacks will be larger under the higher carbon, um, uh, the, the higher climate targets or the higher carbon amounts. Um, so it, it matters and we might have to, um, you know, after we try to stabilize, we might find that some of the feedbacks mean that we have to do a little bit of work, but it's, that's kind of a second order effect that the really hard part is gonna be to get us to stabilize, I, I think. So I'm, um, I wouldn't worry so much about that. It's, you know, we, we really need to focus on um, cutting uh, or deciding how much, you know, CO2 we're, we're willing to, to put into the atmosphere and how much we can afford to, to cut um, and, and that's really the decision. And then we might have to tweak it a little bit depending on the uncertainties in the land and the ocean sink, but it, compared to how much we're emitting every year, that, that's a, a relatively small um, amount. Okay, um, and Arnold wants to know, was the last IPCC assessment wrong about the impact of two degree C? And is the impact significantly worse than was thought at the time it was published back in 2014? No, that, that's kind of an interesting thing is, you know, this report got a ton of publicity because we're going to reach 1.5 so soon, I, I guess. And then we also focused on what does it matter for 0.5 degrees. 
But uh, um, everything in this report is really quite consistent with all the previous reports. We're just looking at a, a lower temperature level, so we reach it sooner. And, um, and uh, we also try to focus on you know, looking at, at smaller increments in temperature um, than we have before. I mean, you know, if, if you're looking at a 4.5 degree temperature change, you know, almost everything is statistically significant, OK? Super easy to see. So it's scientists, we hit the system hard first. And we show it's important. And then um, in this study, we're really backing off and saying, well, how much can we tell? Can we really tell 0.5 degrees? And it, and it turns out we can. So I would say that everything that we publish here is really quite consistent with the previous literature. But um, I don't know, maybe the, the governments were, were kind of right to make us focus on the 1.5, I think, because it got a lot of publicity and we weren't really expecting that. Um, that you know, these, these, were, these impacts were already known previously but because they would be seen so much sooner, all of a sudden people get more interested in it. Um, so I, I would say it's, it's just the, the policy relevance of the question was greater, was greater this time, not the, the results or the answer wasn't different. Got it. Okay. Um, and Susan, not me, another Susan, wants to know what are some of the most important findings that were removed from the report, in your opinion? Um, so I'm, I'm not really allowed to talk about what behind, happened behind closed doors during the sessions, um, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, almost nothing was removed. Um, we really got through everything we really wanted um, in the in the report. I mean, it's because, of course, um, you know, we um, we knew it would undergo a lot of scrutiny, so we made sure that we were super careful and everything was um, clear with the. Uh, um, it was consistent with the underlying literature. And so we, uh, we really got through everything um, that we want. Okay, that, that's, that's good to know. Um, and uh, Mark wants to know, does this report break down the contributions to warming uh, from various sources such as housing, transportation, factories, et cetera? Uh, I, I think in chapter two, there's not, none of that in the summary for policymakers, but in chapter two, there's probably a little bit but out in the literature, we know what's happening right now. So, um, so the, uh, yeah. Okay. That might be better in the last assessment report. It'll be more. The, this was actually a short report, so we didn't redo a lot of the analysis that was already in the last assessment. Okay. Um, and Jay wants to know: Could you say a little bit more about ideas for carbon sequestration technologies? Um, what do you think are the most promising methods? And how do we actually sequester it forever? Yeah, see, these, these are really good questions. And I, I'm super excited to know more about this stuff myself. I mean, it's not my main area of research, but because it's so important to getting below carbon targets, I've really been looking into it. I'm actually teaching a course on this this semester. Um, so the, a lot of them in the agriculture forestry area, like we talked about the biologic sequestration, these can be relatively cheap um, and um, potentially you know, easy to do, but you have to convince individual landowners to do them. Um, and they can have a lot of co-benefits, but, but the, most of them are probably, they can't do a lot, right? They can't, they're not gonna get us up to the 20 gigatons that we need, um, for example. Um, but we should do those. Those, those just make sense. They have so many co-benefits. Um, then there's a, a second group that's kind of the, uh, considered like a hybrid system where it's partially biological. Um, and then there's also an engineered part like the bioenergy carbon capture sequestration. And, and that's the only one we're kind of technically able to do right now. And I already said there's a lot of environmental impacts that might make it so we would choose not to do it. Um, those are, um, uh, th there's a lot of things we could do better there. For example, maybe algal biofuels would work better, for example, that'd be much lower carbon, less environmental risk. There's a lot of research going on there. And then there's what people call maybe the direct air capture and more engineered solutions. And, and there's a lot of really cool stuff going on there. And, and it's moving so quickly um, right now and, and um, a lot of research there. There's a, there's a National Academies report that just came out and they got, have a really nice press release that they did. So if you Google for that on um, negative emissions technologies, they call it, or carbon dioxide removals from the National Academies. They, they synthesize what the state of the, um, the art is right now. And it's, it's very, very interesting. And I, I think there's a lot of areas we should be investing in. It's not clear to me which one will win. Um, so I think we have to invest in a lot of technologies right now. 
Okay, and um, just to follow up to that, there's a, another person here. Uh, Jennifer wants to know if you could talk more about the potential adverse impacts of carbon capture and sequestration and sequestration. And she wants to know, did I hear right that there is only one scenario that doesn't require extensive CCS to limit to uh, limit it to one and a half degrees C? Um, so there isn't just one scenario. There, there's a couple of different scenarios, but but honestly, they had to retweak their whole models with a huge amount of behavior change to get them to, to give any valid right. scenarios. Okay, so so it's a it's a it's a very tough constraint to keep it below one point five. Um, that's true. There's multiple ways to do it, but um, it, there has to be quite a bit of behavior change that that makes life a lot easier um, for the models to try to convert everything over. Right. If you if everybody stops driving the car, it doesn't matter so much that you know how fast we electrify the vehicle fleet if everybody has how much they drive. Okay. So you, you can see how this um, could make life a lot easier. Um, the um, let's see, and then the adverse effects of the bio energy carbon capture sequestration was that the second part of that question? Yeah. Is, well, actually, yeah. It was like the negative negative impacts of carbon capture and sequestration. So, um, so the only thing that's included in the IAMs, because it's the only one that can be scaled up right now, we think, is the bioenergy carbon capture and sequestration. And so basically in the US, if we were to try to scale it up to what we need here at 1.5, we'd have to take the whole Midwest and turn it into bioenergy carbon capture sequestration. So instead of producing wheat and corn you know, that we eat or we feed the animals to eat, we, we would have to convert it all to bioenergy. And, um, and, and really intensify agriculture in the US. So that would um, cause quite a bit of water pollution, cause quite a bit of, uh, take up a lot of water. And um, you know, we're, we're, what are we gonna eat, okay? Uh, if we're not using that land for agriculture and then the, we'd have to take some native lands out of, uh, natural lands out of native vegetation. And um, so that would have biodiversity impact. So those are some of the impacts of, of that kind of scale of bioenergy carbon capture and sequestration. And, and there's always the potential for the induced seismicity as well when we start doing the, um, the geologic sequestration. So th there's a lot of questions about the environmental um, effectiveness of the given technology. Now, now, hopefully by the time we have to deploy it, we'll have much better ideas, especially if we really do invest in, in some research and development in this area, which is really a, a, you know, a brand new area that, that a lot of people are really thinking about now. Okay, um, I guess we only have time for, I think one more question. Um, Jim wants to know, um, there are several positive feedback mechanisms that are near or past their tipping points. For example, the melting of high albedo ice, melting of permafrost, and the release of methane. If any of these are triggered, it seems that recovery may be much harder. How do, you, how do these mechanisms affect your analysis, uh, especially scenarios that defer carbon curtailment for a few years? So um, it, it's always possible that there are these um, very strong positive feedbacks um, that some people have called um, tipping points. Um, they, they get a lot of publicity when they're published, um, but often when people look at them in a little more detail, um, they tend to think that, that they probably won't happen, okay? Um, so there is some um, record uh, from the, the paleo climate record um, that suggests that we wouldn't hit any of these feedbacks um, before we get to two degrees, see, which is one of the reasons that maybe keeping below two is a good idea because in the last interglacial, we were probably two degrees warmer than we were and we are right now and we didn't see any of these feedback. So, um, so there is some reason to think that we won't hit anything probably until you know, 2100 um, in terms of you know, big tipping points. And um, some of the, you know, the release of methane from the permafrost people have suggested with more recent studies is probably not as big of a threat as, as has been previously thought that actually it'll be released as CO2 instead of methane. So it wouldn't have as big of a climate impact. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what the other ones are. The ice albedo feedbacks, probably not as bad. You know, it, you know I can't say for sure. Um, no, one, no one can say for sure, but um, some of these, um, uh, I, I think really alarming climate feedback scenarios are not, um, 
the, the consensus of the literature, they're, they're a little bit more alarmist type statements, I would say. So um, uh, the, they are always assessed in the regular assessment reports and, and um, people look for those to, to try to see um, if, if we're gonna cross some tipping point, but the, um, yeah, we, we wouldn't know a tipping point until we'd already crossed it, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, it, it's a little bit un, unclear um, whether these are really alarmist situations or they're, they're realistic, right? Uh, so it's a, little, uh, it's a little hard to tell. We need to keep doing research on these to try to understand what the, the biggest threats are. Um, well, thanks, Natalie. That's, this has really been really interesting. Um, and I know I learned a lot and thanks a lot for your, all your hard work. It sounds like it was, it was a lot of work to put this together. Um, and on behalf of the Alumni Association, thanks everyone for tuning in to this faculty forum online. Um, just as a reminder, the alumni office staff will be sure to forward all questions to Natalie, the ones that we didn't get to. Um, and you can also tweet about today's chat using the hashtag uh, MIT Better World. And you can also send follow-up questions or feedback to alumni learn at mit.edu. That's A-L-U-M-N-I-L-E-A-R-N, alumni learn at mit.edu. And thanks again for tuning in today. And thanks, Natalie. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.